Hello, I'm Nikki Going, and I'm going to be talking to you about the Crucible. This is session three of our, our discussions. I'll start off by giving you a brief overview of the plot of Act 1, and in this session we will talk about half of the plot of Act 1, plus the themes and imagery that are associated with that plot. So the question you want to answer for yourself before you start your reading of Act 1 is what happens in this act? And I will explain that very briefly. So in Act 1, the, the play starts with Betty Paris lying upstairs in her father, Reverend Paris's house, and it seems that she has been bewitched. She's unable to move, she is conscious, her eyes are open, but she's completely unresponsive. And the people of Salem have no idea what is causing this state. And because they were superstitious and because they didn't have much of a knowledge of science, they usually resorted to witchcraft as an explanation. So her uncle, sorry, her father, Paris, is desperately hoping that Betty is simply sick. But he has very strong suspicions that in fact his niece, Abigail, has actually been committing witchcraft and that it is because of Abigail's activities that Betty is in the state of um, seeming bewitchment. From Paris, we hear about the events that happened in the forest the night before this scene opens. And it sounds a lot like, from his interrogations of Abigail, that Abigail and her friends, including Betty, were actually committing witchcraft. As Paris is interrogating Abigail about her activities, the Putnams arrive. The Putnams are a very wealthy land-owning family. They seem to be uh, in a state of enmity. They're not entirely friends with Paris, and he seems to feel very threatened by their arrival. They seem to be convinced that witchcraft has actually happened, um, especially because their own daughter, Ruth Putnam, also seems to be in a state of bewitchment. Her behavior is very much like Betty Paris's behavior. Paris is desperate to prove that no witchcraft actually happened in Salem because he feels that if his house is found to be the center of what he calls an abomination, that he will lose his power as minister of Salem. Um, but the problem he's got is that both his daughter and Ruth Putnam seem to be bewitched. He then finds out from the Putnams that the children had actually been in the forest conjuring up the spirits of the dead with the help of his servant, a slave woman named Tichuba. And of course he's absolutely horrified by this. Um, the Putnams then go downstairs and they persuade Paris to go with them so that they can all pray and sing psalms and um, pray for the alleviation of the symptoms of the little girls. Whilst Abigail is alone upstairs with Betty, um, her friends arrive and she threatens her friends. She threatens them basically with murder if they reveal what they were really doing in the forest. Proctor then arrives and um, Mary Warren and the other girls leave so that Proctor and Abigail are alone. We then discover that Abigail and Proctor have had a six-month extremely passionate sexual affair and that Abigail was actually fired by Proctor's wife, Elizabeth, and thrown out of their home where she had worked as a servant. And in this scene, Abigail tries to rekindle a relationship with Proctor, and Proctor rejects her. He, he ends their relationship um, fairly absolutely, and when he leaves, Abigail is absolutely furious. Um, as Abigail is declaring her love to Proctor and begging him not to leave, Betty, Para, Betty Paris wakes up and she clamps her hands over her ears and she starts screaming. At this point, everyone runs upstairs from downstairs where they were singing and praying and um, they are convinced that this is further evidence that Betty has actually been bewitched. This is the point that I will get to in this session, but in the next session I will cover the remainder of Act 1 and these are the events in the remainder of the Act. Um, so... When everyone comes running upstairs, Rebecca Nurse just sits quietly with Betty and Betty seemingly miraculously calms down, although this is seen in another way by people like Mrs. Putnam who 
beginning begin to see this as evidence that Rebecca Nurse is in fact a witch. Um, Giles Corey, who is another farmer in um, Salem, John Proctor and Thomas Putnam all get into an argument about land and who owns land and who owns the lumber on the land. And we find out that the state of um, the town of Salem is in a state of constant tension and people are regularly fighting about land and ownership of land. And you want to think about this in terms of why this led to uh, witchcraft accusations. And at that point, Reverend Hale arrives. Now, Reverend Hale is a reverend from the neighboring village of Beverly. And Paris has asked him to come to Salem so that he can prove that witchcraft hasn't happened. Um, but what happens towards the end of this act is that Paris changes his attitude. Even though he's known or very strongly suspected all along that witchcraft did in fact happen, right up until this point he's been absolutely certain that he wants to convince the town that it didn't happen. Not because he's interested in truth, but because he wants to save his ministry and he thinks that he will be fired as minister of Salem if it is found that witchcraft was committed in his house. But then because of things that Hale says to him, Paris realizes that it might actually be in his best interests to um, admit to witchcraft having happened in his house. That in fact, being the leader of the crying out against witchcraft might reinforce his power in Salem and reinforce his power as a minister of Salem. So that is why he changes his story. Um, and he says that there in fact is witchcraft in Salem. And because he wants to prove that there is witchcraft in Salem, he starts accusing his own niece, Abigail. And of course, Abigail changes her story because up until this point, apart from when she was talking to the girls who already knew she'd committed witchcraft, Abigail has always denied witchcraft. She's always said that they were just sporting, they were just having fun in the forest. So when Abigail gets accused by Paris, you can see that her only way out, her only defense against these accusations is to accuse someone else. And she picks on Tituba, probably because Tituba has less power than Abigail does. Tituba is absolutely terrified. She's completely powerless. She knows how easy it would be for her to get hanged. So she confesses and she starts naming names of other people who she says were actually witches. And um, uh, Abigail then looks at Tituba confessing and she starts calling out the names of other supposed or so-called witches. And then Betty joins in. And the act ends with um, Abigail, Betty and Tituba all hysterically shouting out the names of supposed witches. Right, I will be dealing with some major themes in our discussion of the first half of Act 1. These themes are the motives for witchcraft accusations. So one of the things you need to be thinking about is why did people accuse others of witchcraft? And there are many, many motives. The most obvious one is fear, but it wasn't only because of fear. Um, you'll see that witchcraft accusations are also linked to things like a desire for revenge and a desire for power. And of course, in terms of Miller's story, um, he is investigating why under um, McCarthyism, people accused others of being communists in Miller's own setting of the 1950s in the USA. Um, so what Miller is interested in is the psychology behind the witchcraft accusations. Another theme that's dealt with in this act is how children are consistently underestimated. The reason that Abigail and the girls gain so much power is because no one can actually believe for the longest time that they're capable of committing cold-blooded murder. Very important theme in this act is the idea of reputation and uh, the difference between reputation, which is how you are perceived in society, what other people think of you, uh, as opposed to integrity, which is a genuine sense of doing what is morally right. And as the play continues, you'll see that 
very often the people with the best reputation have the least integrity and the people with the most integrity lose their reputation. So that theme of that contrast or conflict between reputation and integrity is linked to who has power in Salem and who doesn't. And you'll see as the play progresses that in fact reputation is a currency of power. Uh, it's people who are able to manipulate their own reputation and the reputations of others that gain power. And it's people that who insist on behaving uh, in terms of their own sense of integrity who ultimately lose power. Some important imagery we'll discuss is color imagery, um, the imagery of temperature. So you'll see there are a lot of references to heat and cold. Animal imagery, and these uh, forms of imagery are all linked to this idea that in fact the play depicts a fight between the forces of good and evil, a fight between heaven and hell. And heaven and hell and the forces of good and evil are actually personified in the play in the figures of um, Elizabeth, who is linked to the idea of heaven and the, the idea of goodness, and uh, Abigail. And Abigail is linked throughout to uh, being a representative of hell and a force of evil. And the imagery is very consistently linked to those two uh, opposing ideas or forces. So the play opens in the small upper bedroom of the home of Reverend Samuel Parris in Salem, Massachusetts in the spring of the year 1692. And um, what I've got here is a picture of a typical Salem meeting house because we discover that where all the action of Act 1 occurs is upstairs. So basically Reverend Paris and his daughter live above the meeting house, which is effectively the Puritans' church. So when the Puritans come to pray, they pray downstairs. And when Salem goes to bed at night and um, lives in his home, he lives upstairs. And... What we see when, when the play opens is a very simple room. It's very stark in keeping with the uh, Puritans' anti-materialism. There is a little bed with a candle burning next to it, a chest, a chair, and a small table. And um, Miller describes how the room gives off an air of clean spareness. And Reverend Paris is kneeling beside the bed evidently in prayer. His daughter, Betty Paris, age 10, is lying on the bed inert. So that's the very first image we get of Salem. This little girl who seems to be bewitched. She's obviously not well. She's not moving. She's not responding. Yet she's conscious. And um, the only explanation that the people of Salem could come up with is if she wasn't ill, she must have been bewitched. And then in the long prose notes that Miller gives, he has this to say about Paris. In history, he cut a villainous path, and there's very little good to be said for him. He believed he was being persecuted wherever he went, despite his best efforts to win people and God to his side. In meetings, he felt insulted if someone rose to shut the door without first asking his permission. So you can see that Right at the beginning, Paris is a man under threat. He feels absolutely paranoid. He's worried he's going to lose his ministry in Salem. And here his daughter seems to be bewitched. He also has no understanding of children. Miller says he regarded children as young adults. And until the strange crisis, he, like the rest of Salem, never conceived that the children were anything but thankful for being permitted to walk straight, eyes slightly lowered, arms at the sides, and mouths shut until bidden to speak. So, the first characters that we meet as the play opens are Reverend Paris, Tituba, Abigail, and of course Betty, although because Betty's not responding, it's hard to say that you actually meet her. And the play opens with Tituba, this devoted slave woman, coming in, and her first query is, how is Betty? Is Betty okay? And Paris is furious. He tells her to get out of the room, out of my sight. And then Abigail comes in and um, Abigail and Paris have a discussion. And Paris sends uh, Susanna Walcott, who is another servant girl in the village, to go and um, speak to the doctor because he is desperate to discover that, in fact, 
Betty is in this state because she's ill. And he says, there be no unnatural cause here. But as a kind of insurance, he has sent for Reverend Hale of Beverly. And he says, Reverend Hale will surely confirm that. And he says that the doctor must look to medicine and put all thoughts of unnatural causes out of here. And then he starts interrogated, interrogating Abigail. And um, he finds out that Abigail probably did actually commit witchcraft. So when you think about the later accusations of, of witchcraft and why they happened, things to consider are the fact that Paris only cares about not being fired from his ministry. The fact that Tichuba is a slave woman, she's terrified, she's powerless. And that Abigail is a young orphan girl who is also terrified and powerless and desperately wants to defend herself. Um, other things to consider are the fact that Paris completely underestimates the children. And at the beginning, we don't know, and this is something you need to decide, is whether, whether or not Betty is really bewitched. Now, certainly the people of Salem would have believed that she actually was. But bear in mind, in terms of modern psychology, it's possible that she simply thought she was bewitched, and that's why she behaved the way she did. Or that she was pretending to be bewitched, because if she was bewitched, she couldn't really be held responsible for her actions. So it was a form of perhaps self-defense. Also, you want to consider what gives people power in the village of Salem in the 1600s. And interestingly, what gives people what gave people power then is probably much the same as what gives people power now. So things you want to consider are gender. If you were female, you would have less power than, than a male, usually. The older you were, the more respect you would have. Um, if you were of color, you would never have as much respect as, as a white person in 16th century Salem. Um, if you were a Puritan, you were on the side of God, and that automatically accorded you respect and gained you power. The more wealth you had or the more land you owned, the more power you had and the more respect you had, because the, the people of Salem tended to believe that wealth and land ownership were a sign that you were in God's favor. And of course, if you had a family that you could trace far back in time that had a really good reputation, that would also give you power. So if you're looking at those factors, think about how much or how little power Tichuba, Abigail and Reverend Paris would have. If you're looking at power in terms of a hierarchy, Paris has got the most. He leads the church. He's on the side of God. He would be followed by Abigail and Betty, who have considerably less power because they're children, because they're female. Betty has no mother. Abigail has no parents. Neither of them own any land. They're both entirely dependent on Paris for their survival. And then, of course, Tituba has the least power of all because she is a slave woman. So when Paris starts interrogating Abigail, we discover that Paris actually knows that Abigail did commit witchcraft. And he tells her what evidence he has against her. Bear in mind that he is all about, at this point, saying that witchcraft didn't happen. So you can see how dishonest he is. But he tells Abigail, he saw Tituba swaying and singing over a cauldron, which implies that she's playing the part of a witch and she's chanting spells. He says that he saw a fire in the center of a circle of girls who were dancing round and round, which, in terms of the Puritan's belief, was exactly how you cast spells. He says, most shockingly of all, that he saw a dress on the grass and that someone was naked. And of course, Abigail denies all of this. She says, no, no, none of this ever happened. And when he asks her, you know, well, what did happen? She just says, it was sport, uncle. In other words, we were just having a bit of fun. And of course, he points at Betty and he says, you call this sport? And he desperately wants her to confess, not so that he can tell the truth, but so that he can save his ministry. And notice how 
His entire focus is on his reputation and his ministry. He says, I pray you feel the weight of truth upon you, for now my ministry is at stake. My ministry, and then, note tellingly, he puts the second, perhaps your cousin's life. Whatever abominations you have done, give me all of it now, for I dare not be taken unaware when I go, down, go before, the, before them down there. So he's not interested in telling the truth. He's interested in saving his reputation because reputation in Salem is power. And um, Abigail denies everything. And then he asks her about her reputation. And he says, I've heard that Goody Proctor, that's Elizabeth Proctor, fired you. And I've heard that she won't go to church and she refuses to sit next to someone soiled or dirty. And Abigail says, she hates me, uncle. She must. for I would not be her slave. She says she's a bitter woman, a lying, cold, sniveling woman, and I would not work for such a woman. Okay. And of course, you've got to think, well, why is Abigail so vulnerable? So in addition to her social position, she also has a very, very poor reputation. Um, she has been fired. And one of the things you want to consider in the light of what Abigail later does is, is she just a scared little girl who makes the witchcraft accusations because it's the only way she can defend herself? Or is she actually a cold-blooded sociopath? Now, a sociopath is someone who's mentally unstable, capable of irrational acts of aggression, who seems to feel little or no guilt or empathy for others. So, in other words, does Abigail very cold-bloodedly accuse people starting at the bottom of that social hierarchy and working her way up until she can eventually, in Act 3, accuse Elizabeth and have her hanged for witchcraft. Other important things in this section to consider, the color imagery. And as I said, color imagery is linked to this idea of reputation and integrity and power. So notice that when Abigail... Um, talks about Elizabeth to Paris, she says um, she's a bitter woman, a lying, cold, sniveling woman, all right? And she also talks about how she, Abigail, has had her reputation blackened. So already you can see that Abigail is associated with the color black, um, with something soiled or dirty, that's how Elizabeth described her. Um, and Elizabeth is described with the color white, but she's also linked to the idea of coldness, a lack of warmth, a lack of passion, a lack of sexual attractiveness, as it, as it later turns out when Abigail talks about Elizabeth to Proctor. Okay, and just as Abigail is defending her name, because um, uh, Paris asks her, your name in the town, it is entirely white, is it not? Again, you can see white being linked to this idea of purity. Abigail gets very indignant and says that her name is entirely pure. We have this high point of tension, and it's at that point that the Putnams arrive. And I've included this painting called American Gothic by Grant Wood because it depicts what the, the, the Puritans would typically have looked like. So very conservatively dressed, very sober, somber, serious people very God-fearing. You'll see there's a painting of what looks like a church in the background, um, lived by hard work on the land. And the Putnams arrive, and they are described as being very humorless, and it, actually it seems that they want to bring about the downfall of Paris, because they seem to be delighted at the possibility that Betty and even their own daughter, Ruth Putnam, might be possessed by witches. They might actually be suffering from witchcraft, which seems very odd when we consider that they're talking about their own child here as well. Um, so they arrive and um, Miller describes how Mrs. Putnam is a twisted soul of 45, death-ridden and haunted by dreams. And she's full of breath and shiny-eyed when she says, it's a marvel, it's a marvel, it's surely a stroke of hell upon you. And she asks, how high did Betty fly? How high? Because, of course, the Puritans believed that when someone was possessed by, witch, by witches or had 
committed witchcraft, they could actually literally fly. And she talks about how rumors are going around the village that um, Betty flew over Ingersoll's barn and landed as lightly as a bird. And then she describes how Betty's symptoms are the same as Ruth's, okay? That they're both lying there dead still and not moving. And Mrs. Putnam says, it's not sickness. She says, the devil's touch is heavier than sick. It's death, you know. It's death driving into them, forked and hooved. And here, of course, we have the imagery of the typical vision of the devil, that he is this figure with horns and a forked tail and forked hooves. And um, we then find out a bit about Thomas Putnam. Okay. And some of their motives for later accusing people of witchcraft. So their main motives seem to be envy and a desire for revenge. We find out that Mrs. Putnam, in this act, had had eight babies. And of her eight babies, seven have died. The only one that is still alive is Ruth Putnam. And now she's ill and she seems to be dying as well. Um... And she's going to latch on to the idea that her daughter is in this state because she's been possessed by a witch and um, she wants revenge. Mr. Thomas Putnam also seems to suffer from a lot of envy. Um, he feels that he hasn't been given enough respect in the village. He's got a very old and um, noble family that fought against the, they're called Indians here, but what more correctly would be called um, Native Americans uh, at, at Narra Narragansett. Um, his, his family fought against them, so they were some of the first settlers. He also um, uh, wants land, and he's very unhappy with the amount of land that was left to him in his father's will. So we find out that he's constantly claiming that other people's land actually belongs to him. And he likes getting revenge. So, for example, he wanted his brother-in-law, a man called Bailey, to be elected as minister. And when Bailey wasn't elected and a man called Burroughs was elected, um, we find out that when Burroughs ran into financial difficulties, um, uh, Thomas Putnam made a point of having Burroughs jailed for his debts, even though the debts were incurred because... Burroughs hadn't been paid by Salem for his work as a minister and so he had to borrow money in order to bury his dead wife and he simply did that because he was annoyed because Bailey hadn't been elected and of course you can see why he would probably resent Paris because Paris also wasn't his choice as a minister so he seems to be absolutely determined that witchcraft has happened and Mrs. Putnam talks about how all her babies died and she's convinced that a, a witch actually killed her babies and it's now a witch that has taken over uh, Ruth Putnam and is probably going to kill her as well. And then the Putnams convince Paris to go downstairs and to pray with the village. So at this point you want to consider who has power in Salem and also where is there a struggle for power so at the moment Paris and the Putnams have the most power but there is a tension between Paris and the Putnams because the Putnams want Paris to uh, confess that witchcraft has happened in his household Paris doesn't the Putnams seem to want to get Paris out of his ministry Paris wants to hold on to his ministry Abigail and Betty are very threatened they could be accused of witchcraft and then of course there is Tichuba who's right at the bottom of the social hierarchy and certainly seems to have been involved according to Mrs Putnam with the conjuring of the spirits of the dead babies of course conjuring the spirits of dead babies wasn't technically witchcraft but it was certainly regarded by the Puritans as very very sinful and extremely dangerous because in speaking to the spirits of the dead you were creating an opening between the world of the dead and the world of the living. And it was through that opening that the spirits of evil could actually have come into Salem and started possessing people and working with, with witches. Okay, so as I said, up to this point, Paris still wants to deny witchcraft because he feels his power is threatened. And Putnam tells Paris, 
Now look you, sir, let you strike out against the devil and the village will bless you for it. Come down, speak to them, pray with them. And you can see that at this point, maybe that little seed has been planted in Paris's mind. Maybe he's thinking, if I do admit that witchcraft happened in my house, maybe I won't lose my ministry. Maybe I'll actually gain power. People might respect me more. But he's still not willing to do that. It's just a thought that's perhaps in his head. And um, Putnam continues, They're thirsting for your word, mister. Surely you'll pray with them. And Paris, tellingly, is swayed. So he's slightly convinced. I'll lead them in a psalm, but let you say nothing of witchcraft yet. I will not discuss it. The cause is yet unknown. So he's not committing himself either way. Then, of course, what happens is we get Abigail uncut. We find out, that's the closest we ever get, actually, to finding out who Abigail really is. Because what you've got to remember is that Abigail never stops acting. Depending who she's speaking to, she's always putting on a persona. She's always putting on a front. And she's coming across as somebody. So when she was talking to her uncle Paris, she was playing the role of the innocent victim, of the orphaned niece who desperately needs her uncle to look after her, who was just being silly and sporting in the forest. But now that she is alone with her friend, um, Mercy Lewis, and with, with Betty Paris, she reveals, as far as possible, her true colours. And we discover that Abigail actually genuinely did commit witchcraft. So when Mercy Lewis and Betty Paris are listening to Paris in this section, I mean, sorry, listening to Abigail in this section of Act 1, this picture gives you an idea of perhaps what they are seeing in their head. They remembering the night before in the forest, where as far as they're concerned, Abigail literally communicated with the devil. She literally has the power of evil on her side. So we find out in their conversation that the girls did commit witchcraft. We find out that they're absolutely terrified that if they are found guilty, they will get hanged. Um, and um, we find out that Paris, you know, Abigail does tell, tell Mercy Lewis that Paris saw her naked. She tells the girls that the village knows that Tituba conjured Ruth Putnam's dead sisters. And the girls are absolutely terrified. And Mary Warren says, Abby, we've got to tell. Witcheries a hanging error, a hanging like they did in Boston two years ago. We must tell the truth, Abby. You'll only be whipped for dancing and the, and the other things. And Abigail rounds on her. Oh, we'll be whipped. And Mary says, I never done none of it, Abby. I only looked. And of course, Abigail has to, do, has to put a stop to, to this because she knows that if the girls confess, she is the person that is going to suffer the most. So, and Betty reminds Abigail that she actually, in addition to committing witchcraft, actually tried to commit murder. She says to her, you drank blood, Abby. You drank a charm to kill John Proctor's wife. You drank a charm to kill Goody Proctor. Now, to the Puritans, casting a spell or drinking a charm to kill someone is just as much attempted murder as if you picked up a knife and shoved it into their chest. There was no difference, apart from the fact that here you would be using supernatural means. So Abigail, at this point, is in an absolute corner. She's got to defend herself. We also find out that Abigail, from this, absolutely hates Elizabeth Proctor. So again, think about is Abigail just a little girl defending herself? Or is she this cold-blooded sociopath? And we now see Abigail's ability to manipulate the truth and her raw, brutal power. She's incredibly cruel. And the girls are terrified of Abigail. And they remain terrified of Abigail throughout the play. So when you're thinking about why they do what they do, I think this has got a big part to do with it. And she threatens them. Now look you, all of you, we danced. And Tituba conjured Ruth Putnam's dead sisters. And that is all. 
Now, that's not true. But she's telling them, this is the truth. This is what you're going to present. And mark this. Let either of you breathe a word or the edge of a word about the other things and I will come to you in the black of some terrible night and I will bring a pointy reckoning that will shudder you. Now you can either read that pointy reckoning as a literal death threat. I will stab you to death in the middle of the night. And she describes how Indians, what she calls them Indians, the Native Americans, who had attacked her parents and murdered them in their bed next to her. And she says, I've seen this kind of thing done at night. You know I can do it. Um, it can also be interpreted as a threat of, I will use witchcraft against you. Because she says, I have seen some reddish work done at night, and I can make you wish that you'd never seen the sun go down. And of course, they're remembering what they saw in the forest the night before. Again, Ask yourself, what is Abigail actually? Scared little girl? Ruthless sociopath. Um, we also find out about why Mary Warren later does what she does. Um, she's completely powerless. She's bullied by Proctor. She's bullied by Abigail and completely intimidated by Abigail. She's also a coward. So she tends to do whatever the strongest personality tells her to do at the time. So Mercy Lewis says to her, Oh, you're a great one for looking, aren't you, Mary Warren? What a grand peeping courage you have. And Mary Warren's behavior obviously foreshadows what's going to happen later. Foreshadowing, just to remind you, is when the author gives the readers, or in this case the audience in a play, a warning or a sign of what will happen in the future. Now, if you think about the imagery in this section, it's quite important. The three colors that are constantly referenced throughout the play are red, black, and white. And think about the connotations of those colors. Connotations, what do those colors make you think of? Remember, this is a Eurocentric play. It's a, it's a play written against the backdrop of European literature. So normally, black is associated with evil and night and the unknown, darkness, fear. White is associated with purity, goodness, heaven, um, angels. And then red is an ambivalent color. It's a color we have mixed feelings about. So red is sometimes associated with things that we feel negative about, hell, fire, danger, destruction, pain, but also things that we might feel positive about, warmth, um, community, love, heat, joy, all of those things. And, of course, you're going to see that Elizabeth is consistently associated with the color white. So she's linked to this idea of heaven and purity, but also coldness and snow. Whilst Abigail is linked to the color black, she's linked to the idea of dirtiness and danger and darkness and hell. But she's also linked to red and its associations with passion and warmth. And look at her language and how it links her to darkness i will come to you in the black of some terrible night and to red i've seen some reddish work done at night and i can make you wish that you'd never seen the sun go down and as i said throughout the play you have this imagery of a battle between the forces of heaven and hell of good and evil and of elizabeth versus abigail light versus dark at this point we meet john proctor so just as Abigail has finished threatening the girls, John Proctor walks in. And all the girls completely switch. And you can see what good actors they, they are. So Mary Warren turns into this timid, tittering, foolish ch uh, young girl. And she really plays the little girl. Oh, I'm just going home, Mr. Proctor. And, um, Mary, and Abigail, once the girls have gone plays the role of the flirtatious girl child. God, I'd almost forgot how strong you are, John Proctor. So, and bear in mind, seconds before she was threatening murder. So what do we find out about John Proctor? Well, it's very important to note that Proctor is, is, is facing an internal battle of his own. So he's got a very, very good reputation in, in Salem. Why? He owns a lot of land. He's very well respected. 
but he's also tactless, he's blunt, he's not much liked, he's got a lot of enemies. The Putnams cannot stand him. He can't stand hypocrites, but he's got a problem because he sees himself as a hypocrite. He feels that he's lost his integrity. And in this section of Act 1, we find out why. He's lost his integrity because he and his servant girl at the time, Abigail Williams, had a six-month, torrid, passionate affair that went on behind his wife's back. Um, he's also presented potentially as a misogynist. A misogynist, someone who basically hates and disrespects women. Um, I'm not saying that's an absolute fact, but it is one way to read John Proctor. Um, one of the things that might suggest he's misogynistic is whenever he gets angry with a woman, his go-to position is to threaten to whip them. So um, when he gets angry with uh, Mary Warren in this scene, he says, I'll show you a great doing on your ass one of these days. Now I'll get you home, my wife is waiting with your work. And later when Abigail threat, uh, is rude about Elizabeth to Proctor, he says to her, are you looking for a whipping? Um, so he doesn't seem to be able to handle women particularly well, and he consistently underestimates them. Notice that in this section, Abigail's personality changes yet again. So she goes from innocent victim, when talking to her uncle, cold-blooded, ruthless, threatening killer, when talking to her friends, to um, a seductive girl woman, now she's talking to John Proctor. And she starts manipulating the truth again. So when Proctor asks her, what were you doing in the forest last night? There's all these rumors of witchcraft in Salem. She says, we were dancing in the wood last night and my uncle leapt in on us. She took fright is all because John Proctor wants to know why is Betty in this state? And um, it then comes out that Proctor and Abigail have had this torrid affair. And Abigail says, you're surely not just coming here to find out about witchcraft. You come five miles to see a silly girl fly. I know you better. And um, he says to, to Abigail, he pushes her away, put it out of mind, Abby. And she says, John, I'm waiting for you every night. And he says, Abby, I never give you hope to wait for me. And they have a conversation about their affair. And it ends off with him pushing her away. And this is his final rejection of their sexual and romantic relationship. Gently pressing her from him with great sympathy but firmly. And then he calls her child. And this is quite significant because the whole way through the play, the men in this play underestimate women and they underestimate children. And um, Abigail responds, how do you call me child? I look for John Proctor that took me from my sleep and put knowledge in my heart. I never knew what pretense Salem was. So she's reminding him that when he put knowledge in her heart, She's talking about carnal knowledge, knowledge of the flesh. He made her a woman. He was the first person that slept with her. He's her first sexual relationship. He is the reason she isn't a child. And she's also reminding him that he's a hypocrite. Because here he's calling her a child when he had actually slept with her. And he underestimates how angry she is. And I think it's her rage against Proctor which leads to a hatred of Elizabeth, which can arguably be said to be the cause of why she went and accused so many people of witchcraft until eventually she could accuse um, Elizabeth Proctor. One of the questions you want to ask yourself is, did Abigail and Proctor ever really love each other? Um, and contrast their attitudes. So Proctor says to Abigail, Abby, I may think of you softly from time to time but I will cut my hand off before I'll ever reach for you again. Wipe it out of mind. We never touched Abby. Notice that he's also trying to manipulate the truth. Notice that he is also hypocritical. He's trying to pretend that this never happened. And of course that makes Abigail really hurt and really angry. And she responds with, 
and now you bid me tear the light out of my eyes? I will not, I cannot, you loved me, John Proctor, and whatever sin it is, you love me yet. Notice that here she's associating herself with sin and hell, continuation of that imagery. He turns abruptly to go out and she rushes to him. John, pity me, pity me. Now, is she acting because she wants the love of this very powerful man in Salem? She wants the status. She wants Elizabeth's position. Or is she genuinely in love? Is this a girl whose heart has been broken? It's quite hard to tell. Um, coming back to the imagery in this section, remember that the whole play can be seen as this battle between Elizabeth and Abigail for the soul of John Proctor. So when Proctor describes Abigail, he describes her in terms of sinful imagery. He says, ah, you're wicked yet, aren't you? Okay, and of course that's also very flirtatious. You can see he does have strong feelings for her. And then Abigail describes Proctor and, she's, and, and their affair. She says, I know how you clutched my back behind your house and sweated like a stallion whenever I came near. And of course, she's using animal imagery here because she's trying to remind him that they had really passionate sex, that this was, it was animal, what was between them. But of course, to the Puritans um, of the 1600s, Anything associated with animal appetites and animal lust was sinful and of hell. So that's a continuation of that imagery that we associate with, with Abigail. And then when Abigail talks about Elizabeth, so she tries to twist Proctor's view of Elizabeth so that Proctor loves her instead of Elizabeth. And she shifts the blame for her own bad reputation onto Elizabeth. She says, she, that's Elizabeth, she is blackening my name in the village. She is telling lies about me. She is a cold, sniveling woman, and you bend to her. Notice Abigail and her reputation associated with blackness. Elizabeth associated with cold and whiteness, that continuing imagery throughout the play. And then Abigail says to John Proctor at the beginning of the section when she's uh, trying desperately to remind him of their love and to seduce him all over again. She says, I have a, s a sense for heat, John, and yours has drawn me to my window, and I have seen you looking up, burning in your loneliness. Do you tell me you've never looked up at my window? So look at that imagery. It's about heat and burning. And of course, that has pos positive connotations of warmth and love and passion and negative connotations of heat and sin and the flames of hell. And of course, when she says this to, to Proctor, she does get an admission from him that he cares about her. He says to her, I may think of you softly from time to time. He admits he has sometimes looked up at her window. Um, yes, and, and just if you link that to what she said about Elizabeth, she creates a deliberate contrast. Elizabeth, she describes as cold and sniveling and blackening her name. Um, sorry, we seem to be jumping around a bit there. So some things to think about after this section is one of the questions you could be asked is whether or not this play is a tragedy. And that would be in terms of a classic Greek tragedy. So you need to think about whether or not John Proctor is actually a tragic hero. Remember that a tragic hero is someone who starts out as a figure or a character that the audience can admire, can look up to, can perceive as noble. Do you think John Proctor actually ticks those boxes? Or do you think he is just a misogynist, a hypocrite, um, a man who cold-bloodedly had an affair with a, a girl who was less than half his age, first person that she had slept with and then broke up with her when it no longer suited him to carry on with that affair. Is he basically someone who just uses and abuses and fundamentally hates women? Um, and of course this section ends when Betty wakes up, wakes up in inverted commas, screaming. So think about what Betty has gone through. She has lain there whilst um, 
whilst Paris suggested that she might actually be bewitched. She lay there while Paris reminded Abigail of all the things that they did in the forest and that he saw in the forest that could get them hanged. She lay there while the Putnams described how people have seen her flying, how um, she tried to jump out of the window and fly to her mother. She lay there while um, Abigail threatened her friends with murder. She listened to Abigail tell her that she would bring her a pointy reckoning in the dark of some terrible night. And then she lay there while Abigail and um, John Proctor had this very adult conversation about their tumultuous affair. And she knows that the punishment, if that ever gets out in the village that those two had an affair, could be potentially terrible. And when uh, Abigail runs off to John Proctor saying, you know, pity me, John, pity me, John. At that point, everyone downstairs starts singing a psalm. And then Abigail sits up in bed, claps her hands over her ears, and she starts screaming. Okay. So, um, sorry, not Abigail. Betty sits up in bed, claps her hands over her ears, and starts screaming. So, the way that Miller describes it, the words going up to Jesus are heard in the psalm, and Betty claps her hands claps her ears suddenly and whines loudly. Betty? Abigail hurries over to Betty, who's now sitting up and screaming. Proctor goes to Betty as Abigail is trying to pull her hands down, calling, Betty! Proctor, growing unnerved. What's she doing? Girl, what ails you? Stop that wailing! The singing has stopped in the midst of this, and now Paris rushes in. And of course, Paris and Mrs. Putnam and Mr. Putnam are all in a state of high excitement because they were singing a psalm and the next thing Betty started screaming. And of course to the people of Salem, this is a sign that Betty is actually bewitched because one of the ways that they tested for witchcraft in the 1600s was they believed that a witch couldn't bear to hear holy words. That if you approached them with a Bible or read words from the Bible or said a prayer or sang a psalm, they would start screaming. They would actually be in physical pain. So you have to consider, is Betty actually bewitched? Or does she maybe think she is bewitched? So when she heard the psalm, after everything she's overheard, and she knows that she has been trying to fly. She knows that she wants to return to her dead mother. She knows that everyone's been describing her as a witch. Maybe she's convinced. She thinks she's a witch. And that's why she claps her hands over her ears and starts wailing. And of course, the third possibility is that she's simply pretending to be bewitched. Because if she's pretending to be bewitched, then um, hopefully at some stage further down the line, she can accuse someone of bewitching her and then she will not actually be hanged as a witch herself. Um, and then finally, there is that possibility that she's just completely overwhelmed because she's heard um, things from Abigail and John Proctor that she simply cannot deal with. She's a little girl, she's only about 11 years old and she's simply had far too much to handle in the course of this day. And of course, Mrs. Putnam's reaction is, the psalm, the psalm, she cannot bear to hear the Lord's name and mark it for a sign, mark it. And uh, Paris says, Rebecca, Rebecca, go to her, we're lost. She suddenly cannot bear to hear the Lord's. So at this point, Rebecca Nurse has come upstairs and Rebecca Nurse, we come to see, is the voice of reason in the play. She's a granny, she's very calm, she's got about 27 great-grandchildren and loads of grandchildren and children of her own. And all she does is sit down next to Betty and just talk to her. And when she talks to her really, really calmly, Betty stops screaming. And she just lies down and she goes quiet. And of course, as a 20th century audience, we think, well, you know, what child wouldn't respond to a gentle granny calming her down. But Mrs. Putnam looks at this and she asks, what did you do to her? And this is the first implication we get that Mrs. Putnam is considering the possibility that Rebecca Nurse is a witch. 
and that is what we will pick up on in our next session. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Goodbye.